about the right thing. I thought we checked that. <laughs> We're good? There we go. Amen. We should be good. Praise the Lord. You can always remove the beginning and the end in the middle. <laughs> good old YouTube Creator Studio does wonders. Amen. <laughs> I'll be a YouTube Creator Studio expert by the time, whenever this stuff finishes. <laughs> Amen. Okay, a shelter in the time of storm. We got the words on the screen indoors and at home. Hopefully you see what's on the screen there. Amen. And I think we got four verses on this. I believe we do. I'll assume we do. So anyway, let's all stand. And we're going to sing a shelter in the time of storm. Amen. Thank the Lord for salvation. He's our sure and steadfast. Amen. He's our hope. Amen. Thank the Lord for that. And number seven, I gave my life for thee. Again, all the questions that are asked in the song that Francis Havergal wrote. And uh, just to think about, let it uh, work in your heart tonight as we sing this song. We'll sing four verses of I gave my life for thee.
about what Christ did for us tonight. Amen? Amen. Okay, we're going to get into our study tonight. This is part two of the concept of hell. We're in Luke 16, but we're not going to go there right away. We're going to go over to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. And as I've said so many times in this study, since we started Luke chapter 16 concerning the rich man and Lazarus, it's not a subject that I particularly enjoy. This is very, um, a, a very sobering, um, how can I say it, uh, a doctrine in the Bible. All I can say to you is this, as a, uh, as a tonight, I'm saved, I know Christ is Savior, I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and it's not because I'm better than anybody, it's because um, I, I realized in my own self that I could not save myself and that it's a simple matter of I turn to Jesus Christ. He did what all of us could never do. And he was my substitute. He paid for my sin and he paid for your sin tonight. And all a person must do is put their complete faith and trust in Christ. Not in their goodness, but his goodness, which was perfection. Amen? I fall, we all fall short of the glory of God. And uh, so I thank God I'm saved, amen? He rescued me, we sang from hell, amen? Praise God, I'm not going there. And you online, whoever's watching, people in this building tonight, if you're not sure that you're saved, you can settle that matter in your heart, amen? Don't leave tonight without settling that matter. Don't, listen, when this message is done, and you're not sure of where your eternal destiny is, you say, well, I think I'm saved, or I think I'm going to heaven. No, 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 it's a no-so for sure so. These things have been written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life. Not, well, I hope someday I'm going to get there. Okay? So, and by the way, the Lord tells us that he doesn't get pleasure in the death of the wicked. Okay, so God does not enjoy, people have got this weird idea, God's like this, you know, oh yeah, they're going to end up in hell. No, he doesn't get pleasure in that. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, amen? He wants people to be saved. He wants them to come, 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 come unto me, amen? That's what Jesus said. In Revelation chapter 21, Revelation chapter 21, I want you to see one verse tonight, and the, the, the subtopic on this, on the concept of hell, first was separation. This one is association. People don't understand who they're going to be associated with if they reject Jesus Christ, the plan of salvation, they'll end up in hell with what kind of people are going to end up there. That's what we're going to look at tonight. And we can't finish this lesson. I know we can't. There's so much in it. Um, in Revelation 21, 8, the Bible says, verse 8, I'll read it to you, I'll pray, and we'll get started on the lesson tonight, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters, and watch this, the Lord threw that one in there. You think, that doesn't seem like it's on the same level. And liars, liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Let's pray tonight. Father, again, bless your word. Bless our time together tonight. Speak to hearts, meet with needs, Lord. And uh, Father, we, we desire, I desire my heart to see your will and way accomplished in my life and in the lives of those listening, Lord God. And Father, please, Lord, just touch hearts for those who don't know you. Pray they would settle that matter. Help them not to, Lord, waste another moment. They waste another day. Help them realize today's the day of salvation. So Father, again, bless and work. And we'll give you all the honor and glory and praise. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So last week, we talked about the matter of separation. And again, some people think it's um, hell is just the place where you're just separated from God. It includes that, but it's so much more. And we went through a whole study on that. Amen. And uh, so anyway, but today, we're going to talk about association. Association, Okay. And a hell is a place where the lost will be dwelling with those who are vile and wicked of all the ages. Um, the Bible says in Psalm 9, verse 7, Psalm 9, verse 7, I'll read it. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. You know, 
and again, as I've just said, preface before we prayed, before I read the passage, it's God's not willing to should perish. And, and God wants, God doesn't get pleasure in the death of the wicked. Amen. And uh, so what we have here, in, again, is with all of this, is the fact that there is going to be an association with people that you would think, maybe here, I would never want to be associated with those. But if you don't know Christ, if you have not personally received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going to spend an eternity with many different types of people in that place called hell. And we've already read in verse 8 of Revelation 21, he mentions a bunch of those things, and we're going to look at those things, uh, some of them today and in the week, in the week or so to come. Uh, so when you study the Bible, you'll find that there's at least, at least, and there's probably more, but just, just for summary's sake, about 16, how can I say it, categories of vile people that will be inhabitants of hell. And the Bible uh, mentions these. And so with that all said, let's get to the first one here. And of course, the Bible, the first one we'll mention is Satan. Satan. Otherwise, many other names. He's the dragon. He's that old serpent. He's Lucifer over there in Isaiah 14. He was the first, how can I say, of God's creation to fall. Before Adam and Eve ever fell, Lucifer fell. And why did Lucifer fall? He had pride. He wanted to be in the place of God, Isaiah 14 tells us. You know, he wanted, um, he, he wanted to take God's place. You know, we live in a society tonight where people desire to be worshipped. That's the kind of world we're living in today. It's about uh, loving self and worshipping self. We have some of that in our, in our society, in our world tonight. And Satan was the first one. He was lifted with pride. When you read that passage, we've looked at it so many times. He says, I, five times. I mean, and uh, so... And uh, he says, I will, and I will. It's the five I wills. I will, and I will, and I will. And, of course, God judged him because the Bible says that he even, I, you know, the, the, the text in Isaiah 14 indicates to us it was just not an action that he took as much as what, was, what he said in his heart. He said in his heart, God judged him for that. The first sin ever that ever took place before the creation of man was the sin of pride. Pride. And if there's one sin that we are all susceptible here as believers tonight, it's the sin of pride, where we would lift ourselves up to think, now that I'm saved, and maybe you might think I'm better than somebody else here, you know, and I'm going to heaven, and those people aren't, you know. Hey, listen, don't ever forget, uh, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Let's not boast in anything. We should only boast in Christ. Isn't that right? It's only in Jesus Christ. It's not in what I've done. It's not how good I am. It's how good he is. I serve a great Savior tonight, amen? He did it all. He paid it all, amen? And I, listen, I don't deserve heaven. If I got what I deserve, and if you got what you deserve, no matter how people perceive you or think, oh, that person, you're so lovely and you're so kind, but you cannot earn it. If we all got what we deserve, we would end up in hell forever. But because of God's grace, he's going to allow me to go to a place I don't deserve to go to because I put my faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, and I'm not going to go to a place that I really do deserve called hell. Amen? That's the mercy of God. So I thank God for that. Boy, what a Savior we serve tonight. And some people say, this is so hard, Pastor. You know, why is God so severe? Because salvation is so simple. It's look and live. Over there in Numbers 21, the Bible says they had that serpent of brass. Remember, they were grumbling and complaining. And Jesus says in John chapter 3, he refers back to that chapter, Numbers 21. And he says, you know what? I'm going to be lifted up someday. And he did on a cross, amen, at 33 years of age, a perfect sinless lamb of God that took away the sin of the world, amen. And he said, you know, remember that serpent of brass over there in the book of Numbers? Remember that? Amen. All they had to do was look and live. No works, just by faith. Look and live. That's what it is. It's all by faith. It's by grace through faith. Amen. And uh, so the Bible tells us that, you know, that it's so simple. It's so simple. We'll, we'll see some more of that when we get to the, 
the, uh, one of some of the inhabitants called the unbelievers, the ones that don't want to believe, amen, for whatever reason. You say, well, why, why would God be so severe? Because salvation is so simple. It's so simple. All you got to do is believe. And, you know, we live in a world where people don't want to believe. Not all. You know, I thank God. When, you know, as a pastor, when someone asks and, and, and is, is curious, is inquiring about Christ and salvation, I just say, thank you, Lord. Amen. And there's been blessings over the year where people have asked different questions. And, and I thought, thank you, Lord. God, thank you. You're working in their heart. They're, they're not sure of their eternal destiny. They want to settle that matter here in this life. They don't want to go living this life being uncertain about their eternal destiny. They want to settle that matter. So Satan himself, amen. And, you know, if, they're, if the one who is vile... Of all, it would be Satan. Satan, Satan. As a matter of fact, my wife and I were talking before the service. You know, the Bible, uh, you know, when someone comes to know Jesus Christ, there's no way that you can, as a believer, lose your salvation, okay? That is so, that's, that's paramount. It's the doctrine of eternal security. And that once when you're born into God's family, you can't be unborn out of God's family, Amen? Just like, okay, you're born into your mom, your mom and dad, you were born into that family, okay? Nothing can change that. You can change your name. You can move to the other side of the world. You can do all that stuff. Doesn't matter. It doesn't change the fact that you were born of this mother, this father. Those are your parents. Amen? So God teaches us through John chapter 3, ye must be born again. So Nicodemus had a physical birth like all of us here, obviously, because you exist and you're in the building. But you need a second birth, as I mentioned last week. Amen? You need that second birth. Because we talked about the second death last week. We mentioned that. And you need to go back to that, that message last week. And so you need to be born again. And once when you're born again into God's family, you are a child of God by faith. Nothing can change that transaction. You cannot lose it. You say, well, what about those people that, um, that say that they're saved, their profession, you know, they profess salvation, but yet you know, I look at their life and I don't. And that's going to boggle your mind till now until the G- time Jesus comes back. Because the bottom line is you don't know for sure. But at the same time, I look at those people and I might say to them, hey, uh, you know, inquire about their salvation. Uh, tell me, what is this? Uh, you know, do you, do you know the Lord? And tell me, your, give me your testimony. How did you come to know the Lord? Amen? And I, I, I'm probably more desirous for people to know that people are saved than some of the people that are maybe not really inquiring about it. Because I want to know for sure, and I want to make sure they know Christ. Not that I make them do something they're not willing to do, but I want them to desire to know Christ. Amen? And so we, come, we, we have a quandary where we think, wow, this person, you know, what's going on? But you've got to remember, um, Hebrews 12 talks about being chastened by God. How would that ever take place if, you know, just like your children, our children, when we were raising our kids, were they perfect? No. Did they, we have problems? Yeah. We had struggles? Yeah. We all do as parents. You're raising your kids. Amen. But, so are they still your kids? Yes. We're not justifying sin. We're not endorsing sin. We're not condoning sin. We're just saying we, kids are kids and they fall and as parents, we need to help them and teach them and train them in the way that they should go. Amen? Proverbs 22, 6. And we need to do that. And, uh, but they do fall. So do you. Amen? We do fall. Why do we fall, Pastor? Because you still have flesh. You still have this flesh. This is the only part, Romans 8 says, we're waiting for the redemption to wit our bodies. This is the last thing that needs to be redeemed. The spirit and the soul, they're good. Amen? But the body isn't yet. But as we allow Christ in us to work out our salvation, that's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, amen? It's the working out of what God started on the inside. People will see Christ in us as I preach on Sunday morning. I don't know about you, I want people to see Christ in me. I don't want them to see Ken Parrott. I want them to see Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what I want. I want to say, hey, boy, you know, they're just, they're, not to brag on me or to say, oh, you're such a wonderful, no, no, I got a wonderful Savior. Let me tell you some more about him, amen? He's the one who saved my soul. 
I am. As even as Paul said, by the grace of God, I am that I am. Amen? It's by the grace of God. It's not about me. It's about what he's done in my life. Amen? So it's important for us tonight. It's important for us to understand that. And so, um, so Satan himself, as we've mentioned so many times, he was an anointed cherub, Ezekiel 28, 14 tells us. And we believe as, as, you know, as you go through the book of Revelation and different places, um, that he was, you know, this archangel along with Michael and Gabriel, and he, he kind of led a third of the host of heaven and so forth, okay? So Satan himself, the Bible tells us, he will be in hell. Right now, you know, again, the questions come up like, wait a minute, you know, God you know, God, God has foreknowledge. God knows. Amen? What, what doesn't, did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurred to God? <laughs> okay. Isn't that right? What, what doesn't God know? He's, he, he's omniscient. Amen? And uh, so um, you say, well, why is God, you know, like for instance, the flood. He knew what was going to happen. But he desires relationship. He desires that fellowship and relationship. He wants fellowship with his creation. Amen. That's what he wants. This is God's desire. Amen. And, and, and so, you know, God's always reaching out. As we preach so many weeks on patience there on the Sunday morning series of, uh, you know, spiritual growth there, God is so patient. He's so, so long-suffering. You know, he is a lot more patient, many, many times more patient than I'll ever be as pastor. And a pastor is supposed to be more patient even than those uh, in the congregation. Should be. As a shepherd, you got to reach out to people. The wind just closed the door. <laughs> Amen. Did I wake you up? Um, you can open it up, put a book on or do something. I don't know. Anyway, let the air flow in here. Um, God is so patient. God is patient. You know, so remember we talked about patience? So, you know, we got to be, our trying of our faith worketh patience with people and with God. And sometimes you just got to recognize that you can't control. There's no, nothing to control here. There's no steering wheel in life in certain times in your life. There's no, you can't, there's no dashboard to touch anything. It's like, you got to trust God. You just got to trust God. You do all that you can, but then there's times where you just got to, God, I just want to take control. And God says, let go. <laughs> let go of this thing. And trust me. You do your part. You got to trust God with the rest. Amen. So, um, so anyway, so Satan himself, um, he'll be there, and Satan was, of course, one of those anointed ones, and so, but he's going to be there forever. He is going to be in this place called hell forever, his ultimate destination. The Bible says right now in 1 Peter 5, 8, he's seeking whom he may devour right now, and as, as I was about to say, he can't take your soul because you're eternally secure. But he could surely wreak havoc with this, the mind. Get you to wander in this mind of yours. Amen? And the devil's goal with Christians, he wants, it, he wants to kill, he wants to destroy. We read that in John 10. We read all that. Amen? He still wants to do it. But he can't take your soul away. It's, it's the Lord's. It's the Lord's. If you're saved, you're in God's hands. Amen? You're in God's hands. But what he wants to do is make you ineffective for God. He doesn't want you to be effective for the Lord. He wants you just to spin your wheels, waste your life. It's what he wants Christians to do. Amen? He can't take you to hell, but he just wants you to waste your life. That's all. And, and one of the ways he's going to do this is just the mind. Amen? It's the mind. Casting, you know, these imaginations, you got to, God, help me, God. Uh, Lord, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, Lord, your word says that I'm supposed to have the renewing of my mind. Lord, I want this. God, help me with this. God, help me get these thoughts out of my mind. God, I need your help. Amen? That's what we need. You got to ask God for help. 
And through that, and again, we need to help ourselves by be careful what we allow in here. As I've even said on Sunday morning, you know, I remember, like I said, in the back in the 70s, 80s, you know, computers were still coming, just getting out, Bill Gates, all that stuff. Garbage in, garbage in, garbage out, garbage information into the computer. Your information coming out and reports is going to be, so God says, guard this. Do you really need to, are you sure you should watch that? Are you sure you should listen to that? It's going to affect your mind. I, I, and I've said so many times during this, this whole ordeal here with COVID and all that, it's really been mental and emotional. Not to say there's no physical aspect of it because people have died and suffered. I, I, you know, we can argue about why they died, whether it was, was it COVID or wasn't. You know, we can go through down all that mental process, but regardless, they die. I, I can't, I can't, I'm not going to be an investigative reporter. I'm a pastor. So I need to just, whatever. This is how it is right now. But the reality is, it has had an effect on God's people. I believe this. Mentally and emotionally. It really has. So, I don't know about you, but my, my when I, you know, when someone presented the gospel to me, did I understand, well, you know, Satan's going to be in hell ultimately forever and ever. No, I wasn't thinking of that. I was thinking, I'm lost. I need Jesus. This guy led me to Christ. He opened the word, word of God to me and my mom. And, and uh, that day, November 18, 1974, we both received Christ as our Savior. Changed my life. Amen. Boy, I tell you, God just transformed my life. Thank God for that. And you say, so why are we going through this? Because it's in the Bible. Why, why are we going through this? Because I think as God's people, we need to be right. For those who are saved, watching and here, have you forgotten what you are saved from? You've been saved from this place. Amen? Wow. Thank God you're saved. Can you think about it for now? Do you have family? Do you have friends? Do you have relatives? Do you have coworkers? Do you have neighbors? that are not saved, that don't know Christ? Do you care about that? Does it bother you? Amen? It ought to. It ought to bother us. We ought to have compassion and care and love and show these people the love of God and say, listen. And again, the, the main thing is, you need to, listen, you're a sinner and you're lost and you need Christ to have complete forgiveness, even though people in this world will not completely forgive you sometimes. You ever have to deal with that one? Of course, many of us here. Some people will not forgive sometimes. That's hard, isn't it? That's hard to deal with. People won't forgive and let go. Number two, here's another inhabitant, ultimate inhabitant of hell. His name is the Antichrist. Otherwise known as the beast in the book of Revelation, Revelation 13. There's two beasts there. One is the Antichrist, and the other is the false prophet. Okay, And the false prophet is kind of be like a, a spiritual type leader, so to speak. As a matter of fact, if you do the study in, in future events, eschatology, you'll find this out. That in, in the future, in the future, are you ready? There's going to be a one world government, a one world religion, and a one world currency. Amen? And, you know, with all this stuff that we've just been dealing with, and where you got people saying, you know, I don't want to touch money or anything like that. Don't kid yourself. Cashless society, this is just one little more thing to kind of drive us in that direction. And so things are changing. Um, but don't be so soon troubled or shaken, <laughs> as even Paul said in 2 Thessalonians. Don't worry, you haven't missed the rapture yet. Okay? Amen? Praise God. So, a lot of this stuff will be in full force during the tribulation. But it's not to say that some of this could be taking place in preparation for that. Amen? So, the Antichrist, he is exactly, in many respects, the opposite of Christ. So, and this is not original with me, but I got this, and I, I thought this comparison is just the... So, the, the Antichrist, amen, he is, he wants to be worshipped, okay? He is like unto a beast, and 
Jesus Christ, the Bible says, that we're going to be worshiping him in heaven. Amen? And, and remember Jesus in the wilderness? Remember when he was there with the, the devil was tempting him and he passed the test? What did the devil want? Worship. He wants worship. Amen? And Jesus, of course, he passed the test. No, nope, no, nope. <laughs> amen? Of course not. Um, the, in heaven, in, in heaven, we're going to worship the Lamb. In eternity, we're going to worship the Lamb. In this tribulation time, the earth and almost all those dwell upon the earth will be worshiping this beast. That's what the Bible says in Revelation 13, 12. And the redeemed will be standing before the Lamb of God. Revelation 7, 9. The beast deceives all of the people here on this earth that are here, remain after the rapture, and he'll deceive them. Except for there will be some that will be saved. There are some redeemed. There will be some. And uh, so um, it talks about so many different things here. Let's see here. Another one that I found here. Um, those follow the Lamb will dwell eternally in New Jerusalem. Those who follow the beast shall dwell eternally in the lake of fire. And there's so many. There's opposites. He's an antichrist. He's an antichrist. So... Every lost soul will spend an eternity not only with Satan, but this Antichrist. And of course, getting back to that thought about commerce, if you don't have the mark, it says in, it doesn't say on. That's what the King James says. In the hand or in the forehead, amen, you're not going to be able to do business. Just kind of interesting when you study that. There's many different thoughts. Some people say, well, maybe it's a chip, it's implant. I don't know, but I just know whatever it is, if you take that mark for those who are lost, who enter into the tribulation, for us who are saved, we won't be here. Amen. Praise God. Don't have to worry about it. Amen. So why did God put it in there? He wants us to read it and know it. It's there. It's important. Even though we won't be part of it. Amen. And uh, they won't be able to do business without that mark. And if they don't take the mark, amen, they're going to die. They don't take the mark, amen. So, you know, there's a lot of things going on in our society, in our world tonight. It's just things are changing very quickly in preparation, I believe, for a lot of this. I, I really believe, and I you say, oh, pastor, you know, all these preachers down through the ages, you know, since I've been saved, they all say he's coming back. Yeah, man, he is coming back. You say, well, how come We're, we keep on saying that? Because it's true. And number two, God doesn't have a clock in heaven. And he doesn't have a calendar. There's no time. We are it, locked in time here. We work with calendars and weeks and months. Amen? And uh, so as far as God's prophetic clock is concerned, it's kind of at a dead standstill right now. It really is, for the most part. It will resume in the when the tribulation begins with the nation of Israel. It will resume again. So you have Satan, you got the Antichrist, and you got the false prophet. Again, he'll represent this religion of the end times, and he'll he'll be in hell also. It's amazing to me. You know, it breaks my heart. When you hear about churches, you see churches, and you find out that they're turning away from the Word of God. You know, where is the standard? It can't be, well, my alma mater at my Bible school said, taught this. I have no problem as long as it, it, it is, concurs with the Word of God. But if your alma mater changes and does not follow the Scriptures, I'd say get rid of the alma mater and you stick with the Bible. The Word of God is the standard. Amen? So we got churches in, in all over the world, especially in North America. I mean, it's like, are they a church anymore? Really? You know, people say, well, I don't really believe in hell. Like what we're talking about. I don't believe in hell. I don't believe God would send anybody to hell. What Bible are you reading? Where are you getting that from? Well, I don't go by, yeah, tell me. There are churches in this city on a Sunday morning, 
if you would question the minister and some of the congregants, you'd find out that they would not take the first 10 chapters of Genesis literally. Oh, no, that's just allegory. We don't believe that that's, no. We, or maybe there, some of them are even possibly, quote, unquote, theistic evolution. They've allowed, they've allowed um, evolution and the so-called science, as the Bible says, it's science falsely so-called, to intimidate them to think, well, I don't know what else to say. I'm not, no, the Bible's very scientific. You just need to do your homework. You need to go to some Christian websites of PhDs and doctors, legitimate, and they didn't get their degrees from Bible colleges. Not that Bible college degrees aren't worth anything, but some people think, well, if they got it from a Bible college, that can't be worth any. Yes, it is. But the point is, from other universities, big name universities, secular universities, but they believe in God. You gotta, you gotta wonder. Amen? And so anyway, so there's gonna be, like I said, you know, apostate religion. Religion, you know, and by the way, religion is man's way of reaching to God. Amen? That's what it is. It's not God's way. That's just man's way. And we see a lot of that going on. And so the false prophet will promote worship of the beast. That's what he's going to do. And you can go, Revelation 13 is the passage that you need to spend time in. So with all that said, every lost soul will spend an eternity with, with the beast, with Satan, with the Antichrist, with the false prophet. That's what they'll be. Who else will be there? Who else will be there? Let's go over, let's turn to another passage. We'll turn to a passage. I haven't had you turn to any other passages. How about, um, how about 2 Peter? That's, that's one, not too far from Revelation, if you're still there. 2 Peter. These are the ones you'll be associated, those who don't know Christ, those who reject Jesus Christ, who say, I refuse to believe. I refuse to accept what this man named Jesus, you know, and, and what he did. I don't believe. I think he was a good man and so forth. And by the way, that is a, a very critical, as we'll see shortly here, you know, what do people believe about Jesus? Who is this? Who is this person who was here 2,000 years ago? You know, what do you believe about him? But in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3, the Bible says, and through covetous, covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sin, Watch this, but cast them down to where? Hell. Hell. And delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So the fallen angels, they will, they are in hell. 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 They are there. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that when you read in Jude, verse 6, it says, The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he reserved an everlasting change on darkness unto the judgment of the great day. And that judgment day that he's referring to there is the great white throne judgment. Those who are lost, everyone who's lost in that judgment, the great white throne judgment, is, is doomed for hell. Those who are saved, you're, you're saved. Nothing can change that. Amen. Thank God. Thank God that you're saved. Amen. And uh, thank God for salvation. So every lost person, not only will they be in the company of Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, the fallen angels. Well, I tell you, you know, we say, well, I wouldn't want to hang out with these people over here in this life, in this temporal life. And I wouldn't want to hang out. And I wouldn't want my kids to hang out with that person. But people who've rejected God, rejected Jesus Christ, the list gets bigger here. It gets bigger. It gets longer. What else besides Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, the fallen angels? How about devils and unclean spirits? How about that? They will be there. They will be there. The Bible tells us, you know, some people don't understand there is a difference between the fallen angels and these devils and unclean spirits. Because you never read of the fallen angels entering uh, human or animal bodies. But we do read of the devils and unclean spirits doing that. We read that all the miracles in the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. That's what they did. So what these, these are some of the type of, um, how can I say it, disembodied spirits who are like servants of Satan himself. And the Bible talks about many times where Jesus himself was 
Boy, I tell you, his whole ministry, you ever, if you ever look in the New Testament, you see it over and over and over again. People possessed with devils, people who were sick, and, and people, you know, had uh, physical maladies and all these different things. And so you say, well, what was going on there when Christ came? Well, if you study the Old Testament, book of Isaiah, and a few other of the Old Testament prophets, you find out the Lord said that when the Messiah would come, that people would be in that state. The nation of Israel would be in that state. They would be having all of those things. And that Christ himself, the Messiah, when he would come, he would prove himself to the nation of Israel, to God's chosen people, by delivering them from these unclean spirits and devils and also healing them. And that was part, part proof of his Messiahship, along with, of course, fulfilling prophecy and going to the cross and all that. So these devil and unclean spirit, what's their purpose? To corrupt, to contaminate, to deteriorate, to defile, to destroy human beings. Go, go to Matthew 8 for a minute. Go to Matthew 8. You, you say, what, what, what's, what's that about Matthew 8? You ever heard of the maniac of Gadara? Matthew 8. Matthew chapter 8. In verse 28. And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fear, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? It's interesting to know that this maniac who was possessed, that the devils inside knew who Jesus was. They know. People say, well, I don't believe in the devil, or I don't believe in Jesus. The devils believe and tremble, the book of James tells us. The devils believe. Isn't that something how people could be so ignorant of that? And then he says, watch this. Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? They know that there'd be a time that they'd be torment. Remember, torment is related to that time of hell. Amen? We talked about that. Even in Luke 16 passage. And there was a good way off from them a herd of many swine feeding. And so the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of the swine. And he said unto him, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine, and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place in the sea and perished in the waters. And they that kept them fled and went on their way into the city and told everything that was befallen to the possessed of the devils. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coast. Can you imagine? <laughs> Here he just, he just, uh, this man was transformed and changed. You read over in the other Gospels, and what are they concerned about? They lost their pigs. They lost their swine. That's all they're concerned about. They lost their business, amen? But anyway, what's their purpose? Their purpose is to destroy people and to make war against the God of heaven, amen? They hate God. They hate God. So those who are lost will spend an eternity not only with Satan, not only with the Antichrist, not only with the false prophet, not only with the fallen angels, not only with the devils and unclean spirits. The sixth thing, are you ready? The fearful. Well, I'll tell you, the, the, the two in that list of, of Revelation 21.8, the two that most people can identify would be the fearful and the liars. The fearful and the liars. But how does the word fearful used in the context concerning hell, that they'll be in the lake of fire? I'm glad you asked. Just think of it. The fearful will be in hell. Hmm. What are these? What, why? Why are these people in hell? They rejected the gospel because they were afraid of what others would say and think or do if they got saved. I'm not, I'm not going to. Get into that. They call it religion. Hey, so-and-so got religion, you know? That's what people, some people used to say. They're more concerned about how people look at them, and I don't know if, you know, you know, I don't want anybody to know I ever went to church or anything, or, you know, I got this religion or got saved or anything like that. And they're more concerned about what people feel or think about them than they are about their eternal soul, destiny, and what God thinks. Isn't that sad? Unfortunately, there's people out there, they're afraid of their family. They're afraid of their spouse. Maybe their spouse is not saved, and they're afraid of what they're going to think. 
you know, they feel intimidated by coming to know Christ. So they're fearful. Because they're fearful, they don't receive Christ. They reject Jesus Christ, and they end up in hell because of fear. They're afraid of what people will say and think. Relatives, parents, kids, grandkids, grandparents, all different relationships, cousins, aunts, uncles. Well, if I, if I get saved, you know, I'm going to lose my inheritance my aunt or uncle or my mom or dad will take me out of the will. <laughs> that happens. Did you know that? That happened. So they say, you know, they may not be saying, I'd rather go to a place called hell, but they really don't believe that hell exists. They can't. They can't. If they believe it's that serious, if they really truly understood this place called hell, as the Bible describes it, they wouldn't, they wouldn't stop for a moment. They wouldn't let anybody stop them or intimidate them from coming to know Jesus Christ. They would bow the knee, amen, to Jesus Christ. People in school, their classmates, you know, sometimes, you know, you establish relationships, you know, if you went, if you've gone to secular school and, and you've known people for years and then they find you maybe on Facebook or something, then maybe you even connect face to face if you did that. And maybe you're not, you're afraid maybe to say some things. Amen? And then some of them who are, maybe know about heaven and hell and the gospel, they're afraid, they're afraid of what their coworkers, their neighbors would say or do to them. Amen? They're afraid of losing friends. They're afraid of a demotion in the workplace. Now, you know, when I, I, when I worked at Swage Lock in Niagara Falls for 14 years, um, I made a point of making sure that I was working when it's time to work. And on my break time, if people asked me Bible questions, I would answer those questions. I had a Bible on my desk. I was a QA supervisor for the plant. had a Bible on my desk. I know some people didn't like that, but I was allowed to have a Bible on my desk. How about that? In a machine shop. <laughs> Amen. And I would talk to people if they'd ask the questions. Amen? And, uh, and I prayed that God would use me to help people, to help them see the truth of the gospel. Amen? But I worked when it was time to work, and I made sure I was the hardest working person in that department. Because I believe if it's time to work, you're supposed to work. You know, well, you say, well, these people, they're talking about politics, they're talking about religion and this and that. Well, I guess I could, yeah. I just make sure, you never know, someone may use that as an excuse not to listen to you or, you know, you may get demoted, so to speak, amen? Some are afraid if they got saved, you know, they may lose their job. Some are. You say, well, really? Yeah, some people. There's fear. Listen, we have, just with this virus thing, we got fear. It's permeated our society from every aspect every facet of our society. And, but this idea of fear has been around for thousands of years. This is nothing new. You can paralyze people with fear. Did you know that? You can enable people by, through fear. And even enable people from receiving the gospel. Amen? They'll spend an eternity in hell, the fearful. The Bible says, the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. The fear of man bringeth a snare. What are you afraid of? If you're not saved online, you're watching this. What are you, you're not saved. What are you afraid of? What's keeping you back from trusting Christ? Do you actually believe that this is the words of God and they're true? You know what? I don't have to go to Snopes to check out what the Bible says. But all that stuff online, is it true? I don't know. But I know this is truth right here. I can trust in God's word, amen? I have the truth. And you have, everybody can have the truth. It's not just for me, it's for everyone else, amen? People will spend eternity in hell with Satan, the Antichrist, false prophet, fallen angels, devil, devils, unclean spirits, the fearful. And I think we gotta stop on this one. We're, we're getting close to winding down for this part. Yeah, I think we can do it. Number seven, the unbelieving. If you remember that list, the unbelievers. The unbelievers. 
You think, well, that's pretty. That's obvious, Pastor. They don't believe. They don't believe. Yeah, they don't believe. The Bible tells us over and over again. You know, in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart. What's that? That's putting your trust. It's just not this. Some people say, I know the information. I know there was a man named Jesus. Um, uh, he's God. He's, uh, he died on a cross. Uh, that's good you got it here, but I, one preacher said years ago, you're about maybe 16 inches away from salvation because you got to believe in your heart. That's putting your trust in. It's like, I, I lived in Niagara Falls for 17 years, 14 in that machine shop. I was working there. And there was a guy named Blondin, and he, he went across. There's a, uh, a bridge there in Niagara Falls. It's the lower bridge. It's the Whirlpool Rapids Bridge. It's an old bridge. It's about 100 and something years old. And it's a short bridge when you cross the border in Niagara Falls, New York. Where there was a guy that went and had this guy wire back in the turn of the last century. And he went across this thing. There's pictures. You can go online. You can Google all this stuff. Blood Dan. And anyway, supposedly the story goes that, you know, they saw him going across, you know. And, of course, there's those other guy. I forgot his name. He's gone across and all these different things. But anyway, then he said, I want to have a volunteer to sit in a wheelbarrow, and I'll take you across. So I use that illustration to, to, to define the difference between knowing here, believing here, and actually believing in your heart. Because the one who volunteered to sit in there would be the one who truly believed in their heart that this guy could do what he did. And with Christ tonight, the ones who put their complete faith and trust in Jesus Christ for their soul salvation, those are the ones that get saved. Not just head nods. Listen, there's many people that know about God and know a lot about the Bible, but that doesn't save your soul. That, that's a start. You got the head knowledge, but now you must believe in your heart. So he says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. For the scripture says, whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. Amen? For the Bible says there also... For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Aren't you glad that God says, hey, I don't care who you are. I don't care what your racial background is, what country you're from, but you can come unto me. Amen? Aren't you glad for that? Praise God. And he's the same Lord over all that, he's rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He says, I want to save you. What is it? Belief. Believe in your heart. Believe in your heart. Go to John 3, and we got to wrap up. I know we got to wrap up. The unbelievers. I preached a series of messages. I know, I think Brother Don, years ago, we used to, he used to remind me of this, because I preached a whole series of messages and talked about, we took the name, the Lord Jesus Christ, we broke it down, and we defined through the, studying the Lord Jesus Christ, and we, we kind of come to a, how kind of like an overview in a sense of defining what it means to be saved by understanding the name, Lord Jesus Christ. And he's the only God, he's the only Savior, he does all the saving by himself from start to finish. <laughs> that was the conclusion we came up to. You remember that, Brother Don? Amen? He's the only God, the only Savior, amen? He does all the saving, all by himself. He doesn't need your help <laughs> from start to finish. Okay? That's, that's Jesus. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So John chapter 3, you know, everybody's familiar with, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only, everybody knows. But yeah, how many here tonight, I can't see you online, but here in this building tonight, when you first came to know Christ, did someone say, hey, I recommend you read the gospel of John? Anybody here? Amen. Yes. When I got saved back in the 70s, that was what we were told. Read the Gospel of John. You know what? That will help build your faith. And one of the subjects here is the fact of believing on Jesus and understanding what you did and understanding what Christ did. Amen? And in John chapter 3, verse 12, the Bible says this. If I have told you earthly things and ye believe not, 
How shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? So Jesus uses the word belief a lot. Skip to verse 15. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And verse 16, we all know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I like this one, verse 18. How many of you ever had people say, hey, you're condemning me. No, I'm not condemning you. You ever read John chapter 3, verse, I love that verse. Because you know what the Bible says? Oh, you're very condemning, you're condemning me. I'm not condemning you. Watch this. Verse 18, the Bible says, he that believes on, on, on him, he that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. You're already condemned if you haven't received Christ. I didn't condemn you. You're already condemned. That's what the Bible says. And then he says, why? Because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. And John 3, 36, and I, got, I know I've got to wrap up here. And he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son of God shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Very simple terms. You know, there's a verse, don't, you don't need to turn there. You know, there, there's a lot of terms in the Bible. Someone did a uh, flesh kincaid uh, readability test on the King James. They found out that they would need a sixth grade education. Now, that was years ago. I don't know what you need today <laughs> for readability, because I know we've lost a lot of reading comprehension in our society and the public system. We're really suffering bad, where people don't even, I mean, when kids enter in university and the university's got to bring them up to speed because they can't, they got problems with math and reading, we got a problem in our society. We used to learn, you know, quote unquote, the three R's, you know. <laughs> now they're teaching them philosophy, all this other foolishness, pumping in their brains, brainwashing them. But in, in 1 John 5, I'll just read it to you. Verse 12, he that hath the Son, these are all single syllables. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. All single syllables. You either have the Son or you don't. And if you don't have the Son of God, you're lost without Jesus Christ, and you'll spend eternity in hell with who? That whole list of Satan, Antichrist, false prophet, fallen angels, devils, unclean spirits, fearful, and the unbelievers. Well, you better do something. You can change directions in your life by receiving Christ. And he wants to have a relationship with you. It's not all about heaven and hell, even though that's the eternal destiny. Praise God. You won't be going to hell, and you're going to heaven. But what do you do in the meantime? God wants you to have a relationship with him. He wants you to spend time with him in the word, in prayer. It's not just, well, I'm saying we're going to heaven. That's it. I'm done. No, you're not. That's just the beginning. Now you need to build and grow. Amen. Come, see, come join us on Sunday mornings and you'll learn about growing. Amen. You'll learn more about growing. Amen. Listen, let's all stand. We need to close tonight. And we covered seven of them. I got, uh, ooh, I got a few more here. <laughs> we got a few more to look at. That's the concepts of hell. It's just things that uh, we need to remind ourselves. Amen. And just rejoice in your salvation tonight if you're saved. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you for the, the opportunity we've had to fellowship together, to, um, God, open your word together, uh, meditate, think upon. Pray, Father, that what was said tonight people would take and understand, and they would, more importantly, act upon what they've heard. Help us to not be just hearers but doers also. And we pray for those online, Lord God that maybe not, may not be saved. Lord, help them to open their eyes and their heart, especially, Lord God, to the truth of the gospel. Lord, help them to inquire. And uh, Father, and God, again, thank you, thank you, Lord, for our salvation. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, the great price that was paid on Calvary's cross for us. Now, Lord, for those who are here in the building as we make our way home, uh, just uh, keep us safe, Lord God. Give us safety as we travel the roads and... Uh, just to bless our rest of our evening. And God, thank you again for your goodness. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Lord willing, we'll see you again.